The issues raised in this video are complex. They deal with systems, with economics, with the transfer of money and the purchasing of resources. Complicated topics. But the reality is that these translate into human stories. If you don't like the price of oil because of the cartels, you will not like the price of food when the food cartels are in existence. Every single individual in this country is going to have their life changed by virtue of these trade agreements. Not only are we losing farmers and farmland, uh, we are losing local entrepreneurs um, and the dollars that their businesses bring into the economy. We are losing um, literally the community fabric and support. Economic globalization, as it is being imposed on us through these trade institutions, through the World Bank and other institutions, basically threatens the entire web of life. Free trade. It sounded like a great idea, and it was meant to. It was sold as a win-win by those who would actually benefit, the world's transnational corporations. But as we are learning from the real experiences with the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, and various other trade agreements, the results have been disastrous for local workers, communities, economies, and the environment. Good paying jobs in nearly every state in the U.S. have been lost. Farms have been sold off. Crops have been taken out of production. Communities have lost local food sources and seen growing unemployment. But behind the statistics are stories of real human beings. It's the 96th annual Portland Rose Festival when the City of Roses, Portland, Oregon, pays homage to its most famous local symbol, the rose. But this year, with the globalization of the cut flower industry, the floats in the parade won't be wearing Oregon roses, but rather flowers from Ecuador. It's more than ironic, uh, uh, you know, to an interested observer, it's ironic to someone who's trying to earn their living and employ 120 people and, uh, and finance expansion and, and develop markets. It, it becomes extremely difficult to want to invest another dime in anything that has to do with growing roses. We're standing in what used to be about 45 big greenhouses. And when I say big, I mean the kind of greenhouses that are going to hold a couple of hundred thousand rose bushes. And out of that hundred thousand, couple of hundred thousand rose bushes, we're gonna generate, you know, 20 to 25,000 stems a day. 10 to 15 years ago, 95% of the roses that were sold in the United States were grown in the United States. Today, it's just exactly the opposite. Virtually every rose sold in the United States is unfortunately imported. And that means that producers like us either have to find another product or sell to developers. We have you know, jobs going offshore, businesses going under, where's the tax dollar? You know, where's, where's you know, income tax? And, and then an employee who pays their payroll tax and pays their property tax when they have the money to buy something, where does all that money end up? Well, that money ends up in, in the investors who have pumped millions of dollars into greenhouse production in South America who really don't give a darn about what's going on here in Washington County or frankly in my opinion don't give a darn about what's going on in a little little farm in Quito Ecuador either they're looking for a return I've been farming this acreage for 20 years I'm a fourth generation farmer what you're seeing is um, the demise of an 82 year old orchard it's absolutely terrifying um, that if I don't make changes, I can lose the whole thing. I can lose 20 years of my work and over 50 years of my family. As a farmer, I do raw agricultural product and I have no control, no say over what kind of price I might return. And I do the best damn job I can. I grow an absolutely gorgeous piece of fruit and I still can't make money. We have issues that are fairly new with uh, trade agreements, NAFTA, WTO, they're negotiating the free trade of the Americas. I'm here every day, I'm on my tractor, I interact with my, my workers, I know them by name, I know their kids, I know their birthdays, 
and I care about this land. This land provides me with a living, and I'm going to take care of it. This is not the first orchard this year that's gone down. This will not be the last. And every time this acreage comes out, it affects everyone here. It affects the economy in Hood River, and it affects people. The best use for this land is growing food. And it's just a sad, sad day for me that I can't stay in business doing that. Communities that had relied on technology industries are also seeing a flight of those good-paying computer chip manufacturers to countries where expenses are less and markets are growing. According to a study by Forrester Research, white-collar workers are affected too. Some 3.3 million white-collar jobs will move offshore in the next 15 years. Computer programmers and technology professionals will face layoffs that mostly hit blue-collar workers in the past. The trade agreements have not only been a disaster for farmers and workers at home, they have also wreaked havoc in the developing countries that they had promised to help. Cheap imports have destroyed local agriculture, sending more refugees to the cities. New industries that had promised so much quickly pull up stakes to head for the next country with a cheap source of labor. Some governments are beginning to catch on. I think most other governments around the world are beginning to understand what the dangers are to their own uh, civil society, their own democracy, in allowing this trade regime to proceed the way it's been going, and are starting to pay heed to some of the non-governmental organizations and civil society movements that are uh, raising the alarm. Corporations used to be domestic. And then they went multinational, but they, which meant that they might spread their um, production in different countries, third world countries or whatever, but they were still American or German or whatever. But the big corporations now have gone transnational. And what that means is that they've really lost connection to their place of origin. They don't care, you know. They may still be American in name or whatever, but really they are just as willing to exploit Americans, American communities, American natural resources, as they are to go into any third world or developing country anywhere else. If they don't stop and say, well, we won't do that here because these are our people. They have transcended nationalism. Trade agreements to reduce tariffs between countries have been in existence in their modern form since World War II. But in the last 10 years, a whole new breed of trade agreements and organizations have been spawned. In 1993, Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. signed the North America Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. The proposed Free Trade Area of the Americas, FTAA, would extend that to all of Central and South America, except Cuba. Trade negotiations in 1994 created the World Trade Organization, WTO, now with 140 members. Most of the agreements consist of a huge body of rules and protections for corporations and a structure for resolving disputes and enforcing rules. They do this in the name of free trade. What the trade agreements amount to is a way of controlling the democratic process so that it doesn't interfere with the free flow of capital or with profit taking. Um, so it's hardly free trade. It is heavily regulated trade. It's just regulated on behalf of the corporations rather than being regulated on behalf of the workers or the shareholders or the consumers or anyone else. It's regulated to ensure maximum profits and minimal interference with those profits. I think it's really important that we stop seeing these as American companies or Canadian companies or European companies or whatever, although interestingly the governments will still negotiate on behalf of those corporations still seeing them as in their interest. But what they're really negotiating is the interests of capitalism everywhere, big capitalism, capitalism that has transcended these borders. And what they want these trade agreements for is to be able to move across borders without bumping into different regulations, without saying, oh, I've got a steep cliff here in terms of health care or, uh, you know, public health care system or oops, these people have stuck some tough environmental rules around chemicals or whatever. They don't want that. A few of the many new non-tariff elements in these agreements include eliminating domestic agriculture subsidies, protection of intellectual property rights, such as patents on seeds, opening all enterprises to foreign investment, resolution of disputes at a level which supersedes individual countries, inclusion in the agreements of trade in services. 
While all of these play a role in the overall picture, it is the opening up private corporation competition to provide what have been public services that worries many people. Transnational corporations used to stick to trading goods, but in the last, oh, 10, 15 years, they've really moved into the area of what we call services. So that could be healthcare, water delivery, education, prisons, roads, even culture, just like everything that governments do, do or used to do. Um, transnational corporations say we want to do instead on a for-profit basis. And what that means is that any country has to open up its service sector to investment by foreign corporations so that your telecommunications, your education system, your health system, your water system, your banking system, your electrical utilities, all of those are up for grabs um, and can be bought out, have to be privatized basically, and, and can be bought out. Um, by foreign corporations. Nowhere is privatization moving more rapidly than in drinking water supply. Throughout the globe, fresh water is in short supply. There is also nothing more basic to our survival. With the trade provisions in these agreements, global corporations are gaining control of a lucrative, life essential service. When transnational corporations get their hands on water services delivery, they are in it again to make money. So they, they have to cut corners. Instead of every dollar of your taxpayers' money going to, to have that water supplied back to you, um, some of it has to go to cutting corners. They have to raise the price of water. And in third world countries, they've done that to the point where people literally cannot afford the water. Um, they cut safety corners. They cut testing corners. They lay off public sector workers or, or workers generally, and they don't have enough people running it. People should worry about their right to have and, and, and maintain standards and regulations in order to provide security for them and their families and, and environmental security um, for the world around them. You know, governments spend a great deal of money providing these services for their people, and people need them. People are going to do anything to get water or health care or send their kids to school. You know, if you don't, if the government's not paying it or you're not getting it as a universal social program, you'll find a way to find it out of your pocket, sell your house, do what you have to do, because you can't live without these fundamental essential services. Another lucrative service sector being pursued by global corporations is health care and medical services. And while the system in the U.S. is largely private, countries like Canada have a long and successful history of providing low-cost care for their citizens. Under the trade rules, those systems are threatened. Americans spend twice as much per person on health care as we do because we pool our funds and then we're able, because of that, we don't have insurance brokers and we don't have all the middle people, we don't have any CEOs at the top making 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year. So we're able to use the money and, and provide a more equitable, better service for everyone. We go to a hospital, we leave the hospital, we don't see a bill. You don't get a bill for one single thing that has happened in that hospital. Why one would exchange that for the individual fight that you've got on your hands when you've got to be the broker between your kid who had cancer and had that treatment at the hospital and your insurance company that's not going to pay it, why anyone would exchange one for the other, I don't know. In the name of freedom, in the name of individual liberty, uh, it's, you know, I, think, I think we have to fundamentally and deeply question that kind of logic. How did I end up in this, in this pan of boiling water? You know, like the frog, you know, just keep turning the heat up a little bit and he never realizes that he's being cooked. Yeah, and all, I of a, am cooked. all of a sudden I'm frog legs and not a frog. A question that occurs to people who first learn about the trade agreements and their effects is what can anyone do in the face of such power and momentum? The most important thing we can all do is resist in a whole bunch of ways um, this model in our lives. And that may be such a simple thing as thinking about where you shop. Everyone has to eat. Every consumer in this country has to go to a grocery store or somehow find food for their table. And in doing so, if they would stop at the produce section, find the manager, find that person who is stocking the shelves, and when you pick up a tomato or a pear or an apple, see if you can tell where it's from. In fact, in the area of food security and safety, there is a movement toward retail grocery outlets that connect consumers directly with local farmers and growers. Those efforts are meeting with support and success. This company, New Seasons Market, over the course of the last three years has managed to buck this consolidation trend, and we've opened four very successful 
profitable stores. We see our role as providing the link between rural producers who are doing a great job, environmentally sound work, paying their workers a fair wage, and we want to connect those people with interested urban dwellers who want to do the right thing but simply need a little bit more information about what the right thing is or need to be told that there's even an issue at all. At another level of involvement, some people are choosing peaceful direct action to bring attention to the issues of fair trade through parades, teach-ins, and demonstrations. Around the globe in the past five years, millions have marched to protest the WTO, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund the North American Free Trade Agreement and proposed FTAA trade agreements. Although these millions of marchers are often marginalized by the mainstream global corporate media, they are having an impact. The time comes when people stand up and say, your system's not working. You know, and so in c countries all over the world, people are beginning to demand of their governments that they start to act like governments again, that they start to provide health care services. And they, there have been referenda in Latin American countries saying, we want our water services back. We want you to provide universal health care the way you used to 20, 25 years ago. I call it globalization from below, and they're saying, we know and we've read about this system and we know because we're sharing with each other around the world and we're questioning it here in our own community so the pressure is on governments from communities all over the world to go into those trade talks or those institutional situations wherever they may be including the united nations and put a different voice or a different set of concerns into the mix in the united states congress must still approve trade agreements though they gave to the president the power to negotiate them Telling your elected representatives of your concerns about the trade agreements is extremely important. And keeping yourself and your neighbors informed on the issues may be the best thing you can do to preserve community and to change free trade so it becomes fair trade. If we don't collectively start to fight back against the corporate takeover of our health care and the corporate takeover of our water and our education systems, it's going to get worse. And those individual families are going to be more and more isolated. I mean, half of the bankruptcies in the United States last year were, were families who couldn't pay their medical bills. Talk about individual disaster. What we have to do is turn around and start to see our neighbors again and start to think about ourselves as communities, communities that can make decisions together that have fundamental rights and to start to say that to each other. It's not that everybody has to be a total expert in all of this stuff, but we've got to find the ways to start to reconnect because the more we let this ideology make these decisions for us, the harder it's going to be, the less time you're going to have, the harder you're going to have to work because your rights are being taken away from you at every turn. I believe it is inevitable that the current global economic system is going to fall. It can't sustain itself. I truly do believe it is unsustainable. That's not just words. It is not sustainable. It's not economically sustainable, and I guarantee you it's not ecologically sustainable. It's not sustainable in terms of, of the willingness of the majority of people in this world to put up with it. My question is, how is it going to fall? And are we going to be able to salvage something and make this a better world after it falls, or are they going to take us with it? I think that's the big, ugly question that's facing us. Can we stop them before they take us down?